Good afternoon. I am so excited to have with us today Michael Robinson and Mindy Oakley. And they both work and support NCCJ. And NCCJ is an organization that helps communities think about in different ways how to eradicate bigotry, racism, and bias. And we know that if you got a brain, you got bias, so you can't get rid of bias, but to help us understand how to mitigate our biases so that we can come together as a community. And so I, I'm excited to have you all with us today. So I wanna thank, I wanna thank you again for taking the time to do this. Um, and tell you that one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you all on the episode today is because I wanted to make sure that people understood the NCCJ, what you all do, what you all stand for, and more importantly, talk about your program, Open Minds and Respectful Voices. I am a board member of NCCJ. I'm a new board member of NCCJ, and I, board, and I joined because of the mission, and it aligned so truly with my personal values, and then as I thought about in the work environment, what I do and how I can help to pull people together and learn from each other. And so it was just a perfect fit for me. So I am excited to be with my teammates here and um, to talk about this fabulous program. Can you tell me um, how you got in connected with NCCJ and how you started on this journey of social justice? Sure. So... I think those questions are connected, but sort of separate. So I've lived in Greensboro for about 16 years, and I used to work for the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro. And NCCJ is such an amazing nonprofit in our community that I've always been aware of NCCJ and the great work that it's doing. Um, I have always also resonated with that work. My background is almost entirely a nonprofit. I've worked in HIV and AIDS services. I've worked in housing. And I've seen firsthand in a lot of instances, the inequities in the world that come down to race, biotry, and bigotry. And so I really did believe that this is the work that I meant to do professionally. And it was a great honor to me to be asked to join the NCCJ board because it did align so much with what I believe in and what I really want to share with my family, with my community. And it's been a really great honor and privilege to serve on the board. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Michael. So how'd you get into this work? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your journey. All right. So uh, thank you again, Kiva, for, for having us be a part of this, um, uh, this initiative that you started. I think it's really great to um, be thinking about how we, how we come together and learn uh, how, to, how, to, mm -hmm. how to interact with each other in better ways. Um, so I, um, I came to Greensboro about 15 years ago as well, which is kind of wild. I can't think I've been, I can't believe I've been here as much as long as I've uh, been alive, you know, but um, <laughs> <laughs> like half my time life. Time flies, Michael, Greensboro. time flies. That's, that's, this, that's, uh, you know, every time I think about that, that's so interesting. It's like home for me now. Um, so I came to Greensboro in 2005 uh, to attend UNCG. Um, I got my degree in education there. And uh, that's really when I started to uh, become more invested and more um, involved in social justice work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, during my sophomore year, I was back home watching a, a documentary on MTV2, like back when they showed like music videos on MTV. <laughs> um, and I was up late and this documentary came on called Darfur Diaries. Uh, mm -hmm. And it started, it was, it was talking about a... Um, Make, raise an awareness about a genocide that was going on in the western part of Sudan. Um, and it totally baffled me that I had never heard of this before. And, and I probably would not have heard of it had I not been staying up late watching TV one night. Mm -hmm. And so when I got back to school after the break, I started to learn as much as I possibly could about, um, about that issue, started getting involved with groups on campus, doing speeches around Greensboro and uh, working with youth around the, the, the issue. Uh, and that that shifted my perspective of the work that I would be doing as an educator. Um, where I grew up, I grew up in, in rural North Carolina, 
Uh, people who are from like rural, rural North Carolina, might not think where I'm from is rural, but <laughs> well, I thought so. When I moved to Greensboro, I was like, this is a big city. Where, where are you from? I'm from Fuquay, Verena. North oh, yeah. Carolina, mm-hmm. okay. right? So yeah. it's like around yeah. the cusp of Wake County, Harnett County, yeah, when you get County, down yeah. to sort of East North Carolina. When I was growing up, I didn't really think about uh, major issues. I was just trying to fit in, you know, I was just trying to. Mm-hmm to, uh, you know, make make my way. I wasn't really trying to, to, to make an impact in the world, really, you know? Um, and when I got to college, I realized there were so many things that I just was not uh, made aware of when I was mm-hmm. in high school. So I made it my mission when I was teaching to make sure that my students didn't have that same experience. You know, we talked a lot about issues that were going on in the world, hunger and poverty and race and racism. And I made sure they had space to have those kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I had two students who went to Anytown in 2013. They came back and I said, Mr. Robinson, you got to go to this camp. This, this group called NCCJ does it. Uh, you know, it, it changed my life. And these are two of my most um, involved, savvy students. And so I was like, mm-hmm. okay, if they had this much impact, if they had this much impact on them, then I have to get involved. I went to Anytown. And it changed my life as an adult. Wow. And so I spent, I did everything I possibly could to continue to do work with them. And so luckily, um, an, an opportunity came on a few years ago for me to join the organization and be the program director. And so ever since I've been living my dream. So. That is fabulous. Fabulous. Now, what what age group were your students? What age did you teach? Did you teach? I taught high school. High school, uh, okay. Were, yeah, I taught 10th and 11th grade English. Okay. Um, which in North Carolina is like usually like world literature, U.S. lit, uh, American yeah. literature. Uh, so they're about 15 or 16 years old, those students who who helped guide me to NCCJ. I know. It's, <laughs> but, and, and I say that because, you know, when we think about we can all learn from each other. Right. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter. Um, where you come from, we can all learn from everybody. So um, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the programming at NCCJ and and specifically the Open Minds Respectful Voices. So I want to know, at what point did you say we have to do something differently and we and this is what we need to do? That's a great question, Kiva. I'll take a, a first stab at it. I'll let Michael provide more detail and context because I'm sure he has more than I do. Yeah. But uh, we have a committee on the NCCJ board that is called the ACC, not to be confused with the sports conference. Yeah. It is the um, Advocacy and Communications Committee. And I joined that committee after joining the board. And when I joined, it was in process of a conversation that had already started about what would be the role of this advocacy and communications committee? What are we advocating for beyond the mission of NCCJ? And how can we really be an instrument for change in our community? So we batted around for what seemed like a really long time, the idea of creating a pledge or a promise or a set of vows Mm -hmm. that we would all behave differently. And we would listen better. We would have more respect and empathy for others. But what I thought was really fascinating about the conversation was we were all in agreement that we should do it. Mm-hmm. But we are also all in agreement that it was exceptionally hard. Right. And that you can't promise that you're going to behave this way 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. No matter how much we all want to, and I think mm-hmm. we do, we can't do it all the time. Right. And so there was a lot. We spent a long time talking about what are we really asking people to do? Mm-hmm. And we ended up settling this idea of practices. Mm-hmm. Something really beautiful about a practice. You sort of give yourself grace that you're going to mess it up. And you're Mm -hmm. going to try again. And so that was really, we spent a really long time getting it right. What are we really expecting from people? And I think we sort of came down to, we're expecting us all to be human, but to Mm -hmm. try to practice these things, to try and keep these top of mind, to give ourselves a lot of grace, to give others a lot of grace that we can't, we don't just human nature. We don't always listen respectfully, but we can always try to. Mm-hmm. We don't always speak with empathy and speak, you know, and, and speak our kindest words to others, but we can try to. And right. so that was really the genesis. That's that's good. And and I, I like the point that you talk about. We're not going to always get it right. And I think that's what happens most of the time. And so because people are fearful about getting it wrong, they do nothing. So, Michael, so tell me a little bit more about the program itself. 
and kind of how it's structured and and the audience and all of that. As the initiative uh, developed, it was clear that we wanted to make sure that we were encouraging folks in our community to embody a certain way of being when we were mm-hmm. in conversation with each other, be respectful, um, listen to one another. Um, but it, as many said, it's really difficult to uh, to pledge to do that sort of thing, to commit to it because we're going to mess up. And and so and we were also thinking to ourselves, how are we actually going to hold people quote unquote accountable for something like this as an organization? Right. You know, who who, are, right. who is the NCCJ to tell people that they need to be doing this or else sort of stuff? You know, and so the the program is designed to do a couple of things. Um, first is to acknowledge that. Any sort of space that we're in has the potential to uh, for conversation to be difficult, right? So this could happen at the grocery store. It can happen at the at the dinner table over holidays. Uh, it can it can happen in the in the workplace at school, right? So there's no particular place where we're more prone to having difficult conversations than others. The next step is thinking about what are our tendencies whenever we are faced with difficult conversations? What actually happens to us as individuals when we're in those conversations? Do I feel like I want to fight? Do I want to fight? Do I freeze? Um, you know, how does our body react? How does that influence the way we, we feel like we need to respond? So starting there, and then we introduce a technique in the program called LARA, which stands for listen, firm, respond, ask questions, or add information. This is a a uh, non-violent communication technique that was uh, developed by a group called Love Makes a Family. It's a nonprofit. It's uh, listen, affirm, Mm -hmm. respond, ask questions. Curiosity, right? And that that, that goes into that question, the ask more questions, because I think that's what helps us bridge the gap too. We got to be curious about others and be willing to learn and and ask questions and, and just be open. So how many sessions have you all done? We've done six sessions so far. Six okay, sessions. all right, six, six sessions, okay. And so is there any one thing that stands out to you um, in a session that you've had that you think has that, that really shifted the, a, a person's viewpoint or the group helped shift the group in a way? One of the things that I try to do as a facilitator is l- help people realize that I'm not some like sage on the stage, right? Um, mm-hmm. I'm also someone who is learning to practice empathetic communication. I have a three year old. I'm married. Yes. I've right. so we, you know we have. There's a lot of opportunities for Michael to practice Lara. Right. <laughs> you know. Yes. So I think that what clicks with people is that wow, I do. I am doing something in this that may be causing um, uh, part of the problem. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's the way that I listen, it's the way that I respond that also mm-hmm. contributes, not just the other person. That's and right. Folks leave thinking there's something that I can do about it too. And despite the fact that a lot of the content is really, it's similar content, right? Lara doesn't change from one session to the next. Um, the takeaways in each session are very different for me because it might mm-hmm. be that somebody says something, somebody else says something that I think, Gosh, that's I should really be thinking about what that mindset or that, you know, that's a good mantra for me to keep in my head when I'm feeling uncomfortable in a conversation. Someone said in the session last week about showing up with more inquiry and less judgment. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's such mm-hmm. an easy takeaway for me to keep that in my head. And I think the ability to look at different angles of something. So the scenarios are a great example. Michael will give a scenario of a difficult conversation and you are asked to think about how do you feel? What is your body feeling in that moment? What is your, th- you know, and they're very real. And so it it helps to think about like the way my body feels. I think when I'm in those moments, I'm focused really for me personally on flight usually. Right. <laughs> and so it's really very helpful to have to sit with that and think it through, endure that feeling, and then get to a point where I can rationally think, okay, I could do this. I don't have to run away. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. have to be aggressive. I can listen. And so it's, I think that each session, there's just this different kind of space to work through things where there's, I mean, there's endless amount of possibility for all of us in discovering our own instincts, our own responses, and just sort of sitting with a discomfort, you know, with the discomfort to get to a place where we can actually be constructive in conversations and listen differently. So it's been, I mean, every time is different, but they're always great. 
So um, another thing, too, that I want to talk about, you, you talk about um, empathy and, you know, compassion and and all of those things are woven, you know, into the program and pretty much woven into what NCCJ you know, believes in and, and, and does for the community. So um, you know how now that we're we're just really divided in the country, right? Around a lot of different things. Um, and we hear people say, hey, you need to have courageous conversations, right? And so they'll say that. And then like you said, people don't know how to do that, right? They just don't know how to do that. So with the tools and the practicing, do you have people that go off and try to practice and do and then maybe reach back out and say, hey, I need a little refresher or um, help me because I need some more help? Ha has that happened yet? Not that folks need a refresher, but people have wanted more time to practice, right? Okay. They say like, OK, I, I, I see the value in, uh, in this. I realize some things that I know. Uh, one, yes, it's useful, but I actually need to practice this in a safe environment. You know, I use it. I always, I'm always using analogies. I, I, yeah. I, I, I treat it like it's a, like a dojo. You know what I mean? It's like you practice here in this place that's safe with somebody who who has a maybe not an expertise. You know, in this mm -hmm. case, but but someone who can um, provide another perspective. And it can just be like the three of us. You know. Mm -hmm. Often I, I've done in uh, workshops where I will have a scenario. We do some role playing. Somebody plays that plays one of the the roles, and so, like Mindy, for instance, may play may maybe take on the role as an observer, and she's simply mm -hmm. taking notes throughout the whole role play. Because what we think we, we you know even if we're just doing role play, we don't think we're going to be acting out our normal tendencies, right? But I've seen it time and time again where. <laughs> Someone gets challenged, even in a scenario, you see that all of a sudden they're sitting up a little bit more, they're mm -hmm. leaning forward, they're, they're tapping the table a little bit, you know, and, but they don't realize they're doing this stuff. And, it's, and it, just having an outside observer tell you, yeah, you, you look you bad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's helpful being able to start and stop and like, oh, wait, I didn't, I didn't do that the way I wanted to. Can I start over? Well, yeah, you can't do that in real conversation, you know, that's right. Um, that's right. And what I have found though, is that people have reached out to say, you know, I was, I was in a situation a couple of weeks ago before the session. And I wish that I had been in the session before so that I could have handled that differently. Mm -hmm. That's so good that, I mean, and I think that, um, as you were saying earlier about, Sometimes we don't know we do a certain thing, right? Because it's just our natural way of doing. It. And so, I mean, I even I and I think I'm a great listener, but there are times when my husband or someone will say, you didn't listen. And I'm like, yeah, I did. And I didn't, you know, and so you just have to have that trust and somebody that, you know, is, that it's a safe space that that you're open to the feedback. A couple other questions that I wanted to ask about. Um, NCCJ. And I know I'm a new board member, so I'm learning and, and um, you know, learning how, how it all worked. Tell me how the community has responded and you all are now getting probably more requests than you have in the past about coming into organizations and doing some of this work and, and having some of these conversations. So, Mindy, have you, um, there's been an uptick, I'm sure, in the in the request, but how are you responding to that, and, and what are we doing to um, help the community move past and, and, and grow in this moment? There's a lot more conversation going on around the divisiveness in our community and what can be done about that. And I think mm -hmm. NCCJ is so at the heart of building a better community. And so many of the issues that divide us are the, are the actual issues NCCJ is trying to tackle, both for kids youth and adults. And so I think it's not surprising that we're getting a lot more calls and we're on radars for people in a much different way, because I think these issues are, um, it's no longer a question of having to convince people that we need to focus on this. I think people know it, they just don't know how necessarily to do it. And so I'll let Michael talk about the NCCJ programming, but um, we're so fortunate to have such a strong organization and NCCJ already poised and already, you know, so much already. has already been done. So much programming is already there to be able to expand on that and get the message out. 
farther is a real opportunity for us. NCCJ, as, as you mentioned, we're probably best known for our Anytime program. You know, most mm-hmm. people um, before uh, 2020, when, when um, you know, if I was walking around saying, telling people where I work, they'd be like, oh, Anytime. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's great because that that just that one is a testament to that the power of that program for young people in our community um, space to talk about what it is like to be young people in this world and and the plurality of their uh, their existence. You know, mm-hmm. um, wh- whether it be race or faith or um, you know how they how they see authority. You know, um, you know it, it's a there's really it's really rare to get that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, with young people. And a lot of times what people would say is like, oh, well, I wish we had an adult version of this. But, you know, it, it can be difficult to get adults in the room to talk about yeah. their differences <laughs> and how they see things, honestly. <laughs> you know, it took yeah. a reckoning like this. Right? Yeah. It took the summer of 2020 before people were saying, you know what, I, it doesn't matter if there's a business case for this. We need to start having these conversations because something's mm-hmm. different. And the pandemic alongside the, you know, the death of George Floyd and others and the reckoning that happened after that. And people weren't able to divert or uh, avert their attention from it because we all were at home, you know, <laughs> no matter what, and no matter where you turn, yep. no matter what it news channel you were looking at, social media, there was no escape. And so it, it has called us up, I believe, to say, you know, how can we engage in this truth that we know is there and we maybe have been avoiding and who can help us with that. And it, mm-hmm. it, it, it certainly helps that there's an organization like ours that literally has fighting bias, bigotry, and racism in its mission. <laughs> so if you just Google fighting yeah, racism, right. we're going to pop up. <laughs> Somewhere on that list, NCCJ right. is going to pop up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's so, right. And so, like, like Mindy said, having been poised to be that um, organization in a community. We've been, NCCJ has been a part of the Triad community for over 80 years. So, mm-hmm. so whether it be folks who have sent their students to any town over the last 30 years, folks who've been involved with the Citation Award Dinner for the last 70 years, uh, folks who have known about the history of NCCJ as an interfaith organization that has over decades focus much more on other social social justice issues, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's rare to find an organization like ours that's regional, that focuses just on the local community and building those partnerships and relationships. Like Mindy said, she knew about NCCJ from the work she had been doing for decades, out, you know, before even being involved directly with NCCJ. So mm-hmm. I, I think that the timing was right for us to be in a position to help people exactly where they are. You know, NCCJ is an organization that meets people where they are. And we believe that change happens with a conversation. In order to do that, we got to have the tools to do, to, to be able to have the conversation. We got to do some introspection. We, we have to think about our perspective, that your perspective matters just as much as anybody else's. It doesn't matter your color, creed, uh, or background. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So if somebody wanted to attend, how many people can you have in a session? I mean, I know you're doing it virtual, so it's kind of probably, it's a little bit harder because we know with these conversations, we want to be with people, right? And so I know that's difficult because we're having to, we had to pivot to, you know, and, and do everything virtual. So what is the capacity for one of your classes? I would, you know, we try to keep it to about 30 people. Okay. Um, for that For that reason of being able to have it, be um, as intimate as possible over Zoom. You know, I think yeah. the, the largest the largest group we've had so far has been about twelve or fifteen, and that uh, that works because it gets people the opportunity to talk to each mm-hmm. other. You know, I can yes. kind of fade into the background a little bit because um, the folks expect. You know, it's almost you know, even in Zoom. When there's only a few people in the in the box, you kind of you feel that kind of pressure. Like, I guess I should say something because right. there's no, we're, the only, we're the only people in the room. So anybody can can sign up to attend, right? Oh it's yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's for anybody of. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah, we it's had we had one all. session. Somebody we had somebody calling from London. One session, really? Um, you know, yeah, you know. So it, it's open to the public. 
Yeah. Um, tell a friend, send a link. And I'll say too, Kiva, there's a certain, I think that there's a certain vulnerability people have to kind of overcome to sign up for one of these, right? Like, I think there's yeah, a concern right. of, I'm going to be judged, or I'm going to do it wrong, or I'm not going to know what I'm doing, or I missed the first couple. What if I don't know the basics? Um, mm -hmm. None of those are adequate excuses. <laughs> That's right. Do not sign up for this. Um, Michael makes it an unbelievably supportive, judgment-free zone. I think we've got folks who participate and readily share. We have others who really kind of take it all in and listen and still learn. Mm -hmm. I just think I want people to know that it's not a, you're not spotlighted in, oh, now we're going to watch how Mindy reacts to these tough right. conversations. Let's see how <laughs> she'll screw it up. We're going to put it's Mindy on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. It is, um, and I, I share some of that vulnerability of want, not wanting to do it wrong in front of everybody. Right. There's none of that in this at all. And so I encourage people to sort of take that first step, sign up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. So I have a couple more questions and I call these my lightning rod questions. And I want to go over them and I'm just going to say the question and then you all answer. Okay. So one change everyone can make to ensure that they are a better listener. Practice meditation. Practice meditation. Okay. Yep. Practice meditation because it, it is a practice of detaching from distracting thoughts. And so oftentimes when people are in conversation, they're preparing to respond and they're getting their, their, their response first. So you stop listening when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, but meditation literally is asking you to let your thoughts pass by, to acknowledge mm -hmm. them that they're there, but let them pass by. Mm -hmm. And so you don't latch on to one thought and say, ooh, I'm going to use this one. And then the conversation flows by. That person's not even talking about that thing anymore. You're like, okay, <laughs> let me go back to what you were saying about this. It's like, that, the conversation is down the road. Why, why are you still standing back here? You know? Right. And so if you can practice letting the thoughts go, uh, if it's an important thought, it will come back to you in the flow of conversation. And I would say, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Try and intentionally do that. Okay. Tell me a word that you wish you could banish from the world. I'll be honest, Kiva, I have thought about this and thought about this, knowing that this was one of the questions that we <laughs> might have. And there are a million derogatory, right. mean-spirited words that I would do away with, but I can't come up with one that's not, you know, on that list of a million really derogatory and mean-spirited words. Okay. All right, you, we'll go with you that, know, Michael. So mine, mine is more of a phrase, and, it, okay. and, it's, and it's the other. Right. The, I would I would like that to be to be banished from our, our lexicon. And the, because to me, it implies that there are what I call mains. Right. There are people who are like who are mainstream and everybody else is an outsider. And they can only, they're only to be considered uh, for what they may be able to, to add to the people who are already on the inside. Right. So we have to consider the other. Like, no, I'm here. I've been here. What do you mean? Right. Consider me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've been here all the time. I've right. been here the whole time. So yeah. I don't need to be considered. I am. So tell me what a best tactic is to de-escalate a tense exchange. All right, I'll tell you what I learned from Michael in our session okay. last week. My in okay. instinctually is try to find common ground. Okay. Try and find something on which we can agree. As small or as big as it might be, find that commonality, establish there's that connection. And I always believe that in any situation, smiling helps. So the hardest is hard as I even as I think about it, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so unpopular. But avoid <laughs> getting upset. <laughs> avoid getting upset. Um, once you lose your temper, you lose. There's no, there's no way to get it back. And and if it means you got to take a break, take a break. Literally, if you might, even if you don't have to do, use the bathroom, say, I got to use the bathroom real quick. Take mm -hmm. 10 seconds. Because, mm -hmm. it, you know, anything that you can do to refocus the energy uh, and not just keep it going into anger mode or going into tension, the better. Well, this has been fabulous. I have truly enjoyed learning from you all and spending time um, just to... To, to, to know that we're all in this together and we all have a role to play. And so it's just so refreshing to know that NCCJ is there. You all are, 
are seasoned in this and, and ready to help us build the bridge and, and have a community that's free of racism and, and bigotry, because just imagine what that world would look like and feel like, right? And so, and we're all on that journey and we all wanna, we, that's our mission. And so um, I appreciate you all taking the time to be with us and um, I will promote your programs. So um, we will definitely do that and make sure that people know about NCCJ and, and all of the offerings that they have. And, um, and hey, we got a lot of work to do and we are the right, with, it's time for us to, to take the leap and do the work that needs to be done. So I so appreciate you all doing that. And I will talk to you all later. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much Thank for having so us, Eva. This was so fun. Thank you.